The year was 8000 BCE. A small band of foragers rested at the banks of a lagoon near Lake Turkana in modern day Kenya. The land was becalmed and silent, and suddenly, the call of a man pierced the evening air. Beyond the horizon, the group witnessed men wielding spears and bows sprinting toward them. The foragers braced themselves for an attack, with the men forming a circle around the women and children. Stone arrows soon fell from the orange evening sky and impaled the skulls of two of the foragers, immediately killing them. Those who remained attempted to defend their families as the attackers reached their line. A deadly and brutal melee ensued. Arrows whistled and the skulls of men cracked beneath the weight of stone clubs. The echoes of battle were punctuated by the cries of women and children, as they too were slaughtered by this band of marauders. Within minutes, it was over. The raiders gathered what few supplies were left by the now fallen foragers. Only two of the foragers were left alive. They were bound by twine fetters, and they were left to widow and starve under the sultry African sun. Archaeologists have long questioned the origins of warfare. When did humanity's propensity for violence begin? Or more specifically, when did human groups begin to coordinate attacks upon other human groups? Recorded history tells us that the first war was fought in 2700 BCE between the Mesopotamian state of Sumer and the Iranian state of Alam. But does this mean that prehistory, a span of time which occupies most of the human story, was devoid of conflict? In the 20th century, most scholars abided by the philosophical doctrine of the 18th century French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau when answering this question. Rousseau held that quote-unquote pre-civilized humanity lived in an egalitarian quote-unquote state of nature and was naturally and fundamentally peaceful. Their environment was abundant in resources and due to their hunter-gatherer lifestyle, they were supposedly not inundated by the violent territoriality of their quote-unquote civilized descendants. So in essence, 20th century scholars upheld the notion that warfare is a corollary of civilization, of agrarianism, sedentarism, and states. But we know that this is no longer true. Archaeological research has revealed that conflict has always been an unfortunate component of the human story. Perhaps the most intriguing piece of evidence of pre-state, prehistoric conflict comes from what has been deemed the Nataruk Massacre. In 2012, researchers from Cambridge University's Leverhulme Center for Human Evolutionary Studies uncovered the 10,000-year-old remains of 27 individuals in a site called Nataruk, which lies 30 kilometers west of Lake Turkana in Kenya. Nataruk sits near the reconstructed margin of the late Pleistocene, early Holocene Lake, Paleo Turkana, at the eastern edge of a depression which would have formed a lagoon during periods of heavy rainfall. From radiocarbon and optical luminescence dating methods, Archaeologists have settled upon an age estimate of 9,500 to 10,500 years BP for the people of Nataruk. This antiquity is congruous with the ages gathered from nearby shells, harpoons, and charcoal from sites in the immediate vicinity, and corresponds to a phase of early Holocene high lake levels in Turkana. Most of the Nataruk remains were found in a fully exposed and fragmented state. Among these skeletons, there is absolutely no evidence of them being placed in burial pits and no standardized positioning or orientation of the head, face, or body. Thus, there is absolutely nothing to suggest that the Nataruk people were peacefully interred. Of the 27 individuals recorded, 21 were adults, including 8 males, 8 females, and 5 unknowns. The remains of 6 children were uncovered and the fragments of a 6-9 to nine month old fetus were found in the abdominal cavity of an adult female. 10 of the 12 skeletons in situ possess evidence of major traumatic lesions that would have been lethal and probably resulted in an immediate death. These include sharp force trauma to the head and or neck, probably associated with arrow wounds, 5 cases of blunt force trauma to the head, 2 cases of possible anti-mortem depressed bilateral fractures of the knees, two cases of multiple fractures to the right hand, and an incidence of fractured ribs. Only two of the skeletons in situ, with one being that of the pregnant female, lack evidence of perimortem trauma. 
although in both cases the position of the hands suggests that the individuals may have been bound at the time of death. The pregnant female was uncovered in a quite unusual sitting position, with their arms crossed over one another in the shape of an X. If these two individuals were bound, the perpetrators must have then left these poor souls to slowly fall victim to malnourishment and exposure. It would have been a sad, painful, and slow death. Three artifacts were embedded in two of the bodies. The first of these was an obsidian bladelet found lodged in one of the male crania. This weapon didn't perforate the skull, but another lesion shows that a second weapon did, crushing the entire front part of the head and face. Now here's what Marazin Lar, the lead researcher on the Nadaruk site, had to say about this skeleton. Quote, The man appears to have been hit in the head by at least two projectile points and in the knees by a blunt instrument falling face down into the lagoon's shallow water. End quote. The other two objects found at the site were two microliths, one chert lunate, and an obsidian trapeze, found within the pelvic and thoracic cavities of a male skeleton. Each of these items displayed impact scars. It should be noted that obsidian is a rarity in other early Holocene sites around Lake Turkana. So the presence of obsidian tools at Nataruk suggests that the two groups which met here had very different home ranges. These findings evince that the Nataruk hunter-gatherers were attacked and killed by another group of prehistoric foragers. There is absolutely no other explanation for the presence of the traumatic lesions upon the skeletal remains found at this site. This incident, then, is the earliest scientifically dated evidence of intergroup conflict among prehistoric hunter-gatherers. It is an archaic precursor to what we would call warfare. But we've got to ask ourselves, what really caused this violence to occur? 10,000 years ago, the environment of Lake Turkana differed markedly from its contemporary arid condition. It was a fertile lakeshore landscape that sustained a large population of hunter-gatherers. The presence of pottery in this region is indicative of storage practices and therefore a possible reduction in mobility. Thus, there may have been some rudimentary level of territoriality among the Nataruk people. If this is indeed the case, then the massacre at Nataruk could be construed as resulting from a raid for resources, women, children, and food stored in pots, which had a value analogous to later agrarian societies, among whom violent attacks on settlements and defense strategies became an integral part of life. However, the evidence at Nataruk may not even reveal a transition toward a more sedentary and materially wealthy way of life. It could simply instead represent a random, rather violent, encounter between two groups of mobile foragers. Yet in either case, it must be noted that the events at Nataruk attest to the incredible antiquity of intergroup violence and war.